How's it going folks, I'm Rabbi here with the first of three parts in an updated Millennium Dawn tutorial. This mod is big and changes a lot of features from vanilla Hearts of Iron 4, and as such requires the depth needed to understand it properly. When I first tried to learn it, I almost gave up due to being intimidated by the feature, but don't worry, if you watch these videos you will be able to enjoy it easily. As there is currently no other quality modern day game or mod, this is the only place you can go to find a modern geopolitical simulator. In this episode, we will be covering the military features of Millennium Dawn. Hearts of Iron, the core game MD is built upon, is a military game by nature, so it seems wise to start with it. Generally remember, this is fairly different from vanilla, and it should be treated as such. Let's get started. I want to start with a very basic intro to how military mechanics are balanced in Millennium Dawn. This tutorial is for the 1.7 update, so if you're watching this in 1.8 or beyond, things may be a little bit different. Air is the most important part of Hoi and Millennium Dawn. If you have air superiority and some good close air support, you can win battles with the most basic of units. That being said, aircraft are very expensive to produce, so unless you're a major power or plan on spending a lot of time developing a war economy, you will not have the abundance of air to rely upon. Beyond that, with the addition of the tank designer system, it is no longer the case that IFVs are the best out there, which I discussed in the old video. Tanks are very expensive to produce as well, especially the good kind, but are absolutely the best units out there if you can produce enough of them. Therefore, if you want to be comfortably winning games, look to develop a good air force and tank core. Beyond that, ballistic missiles are a very powerful breakthrough tool if you have the economy and tech to produce them, which we'll get into later on. The obvious difference from vanilla in terms of research is that there is a lot more of it. I will go over each tab to give you a general understanding of what it covers and how important it is for you. Just like vanilla, the non-military research techs and production efficiency techs are king, so make sure to always have a research slot or two on them. The infantry tab covers everything your basic units will be using. The only two actually producible techs here are infantry equipment, which is the backbone of your military, and support equipment. It is important to try and keep these somewhat up to date, as they will do wonders for making your infantry actually useful. The rest of the text concern general bonuses that you can pick and choose at your own discretion. The Special Forces line is very useful, as Special Force divisions are incredibly powerful due to their cheapness for what they give you. Night Vision Goggles are incredibly powerful in helping to reduce the penalties that come with night offensives, and should be considered as well. The Vehicles tab covers all of your non-artillery and tank-based equipment. When it comes to APCs and IFEs, it is generally a good idea to simply pick one to use in your divisions. They both act as a powerful complement to infantry in your divisions, or to build up a tank division. This decision is a simple question of cost. IFEs are much stronger, and give you way more power for every unit you put on the battlefield, although their cost is much higher, almost double an APC in fact. Generally, I choose APCs if I know I will struggle for military factories, and don't plan to fight major powers anytime soon. If I am a major power, and powerful military producer, I will always take IFEs due to the fact that they are so much better. Recon tanks give some recon and are generally not worth it, and utility vehicles are needed for most divisions, and should be kept up to date whenever possible. The 1.7 update will be bringing the tank designer to Millennium Dawn and with it comes the ability to customize armor to your heart's desire. Generally, tanks lets you get the best divisions in the game, but do note it is very costly. Putting out a lot of high-tech tanks will require lots of time or lots of industry, and there are no shortcuts. Just like vanilla, the left side consists of your tank modules, the main difference being higher fuel costs, reliability, and more armor for each additional level. Computer stations give you huge stat boosts especially in Breakthrough and Defense, as well as access to more modules. Armor, engines, and guns are straightforward. The better the modules, the better the tanks you are able to produce. Light guns are great for giving soft attack, which shreds infantry and anything but armor. Heavy guns give high heart attack, which lets you easily push other armored divisions in the game. I personally like to use medium, as it's a good middle ground, but that is totally up to you. Next we have the Artillery tab. This also covers anti-tank and anti-air. Artillery is another very key aspect to most infantry divisions. 
It can move fairly quickly and gives a good deal of soft attack. SP artillery is generally better though. It is a bit slower and has a fuel cost associated with it. The difference is that artillery only requires steel, which is readily available, whereas SP artillery requires technology metals, light metals, and rubber, which can be much harder to come by. As with real life, it is important to remember that the better option is not always the most viable for you. What your nation has to work with resource-wise will drastically limit what you are able to field, unless you rely upon imports, which can be damaging to your economy. ATGMs, or anti-tank guided missiles, are what you will use in your infantry divisions to get some piercing and hard attack. The better the tech on these, the better you will be able to deal with armored divisions, with mechanized or basic infantry. The sub-research on these also gives you tank designer modules for piercing, which can be useful. Anti-air gives basic divisions a small degree of AA. This is vital if you are to remain competitive in the air, which defines Hoi 4 and Millennium Dawn. Keeping up to date on AA is key. Likewise, the special module gives you an AA tank designer option. The naval tab is composed of vessel holes on the top part of the screen. The main thing to remember for getting more advanced modules is that their resource cost will go up drastically, including certain resources that may be hard to come by, such as technology metals and precious metals. The next section covers the motors and special components that make your ships truly deadly. Engines will dictate speed of the ship, which makes them harder to hit in combat, as well as surface visibility, which does the same. Engines also define max range, which can be very important. You want to be able to send your ships and fleet on missions that are well past the shores of your country, so keep that in mind. Nuclear engines are particularly useful, as they have no fuel cost and are absolutely massive range. If you can't afford it, they are worth putting onto your ships. Fire control systems give a massive stat boost and should always be prioritized. The difference between radar and sonar is that radar is designed for attacking and spotting surface vessels like corvettes or carriers, whereas sonar is used to track down and kill submarines, which is not easy to do. They do a bit of both, but should be specialized to one or the other. Both also give a percentage boost to ship stats, with radar giving a far better option. The next three tabs cover aircraft which operates similar to vanilla. Generally though, it is important to note that air superiority fighters, multi-role fighters, and close air support are the most useful and should generally be prioritized for research. We will cover this more in the air tutorial. The electronics tab is full of research bonuses, which are incredibly important and should always be prioritized. It also contains some military industrial option bonuses, which dictate how much military factories are able to produce and how quickly. AI tech includes a lot of production efficiency as well, which allows you to produce much more equipment per week. For industrial technology, we have many of the most important techs in the game. If you have played a fair bit of vanilla Hoi 4, you will know that these are the techs you should always go for first. Construction speed allows you to build industry quicker, and excavating, more resources extracted. For the military part of this tab, Nanofibers and 3D printers are what you want, as they will transform your military production. Nanofibers give industrial output, which again, is more production power per military factory and dockyard output for even more naval vessels. Printers give efficiency, which means over time, you'll be able to become more efficient at producing certain equipment types. Fuel refining is also very important, as it gives you more fuel per oil you produce or import allowing you to have less fuel logistical issues. Millennium Dawn divisions require a lot of fuel, so these are worth getting unless you're Saudi Arabia. The space technology screen covers satellites, which we will cover in the Econ tutorial. Space weapons, which can be used to knock out enemy satellites, and OLVs, which are used to launch satellites into orbit. The ballistic missile menu covers intermediate and intercontinental missile systems. The main difference between the two is range and cost. Intercontinental missiles are able to fire a lot further away, but cost more to build. Intermediate ballistic missiles are cheaper and better for hitting targets closer to your own borders. Launch control centers are what dictates how many ballistic missile silos you can build in a province, which lets you launch more missiles at once. The cruiser missile tab involves the missile tech for launching missiles from planes, TEL batteries, and ships. Generally, I would advise you don't use these, as they are inconvenient technology and range-wise. 
The missile defense tab is very important for protecting its nuclear and ballistic missile strikes. At present, the AI is not programmed to launch them offensively, but this may change in the future. If you are in a multiplayer game and plan any sort of PvP, these are what will save you from complete destruction. SAMs and ABMs will attempt to intercept incoming missiles if they are within range of where the missile is going to strike. The more advanced a version you are using, the higher chance of interception. Both will try to intercept, so having them both is worthwhile as well as generally being a case of quantity being better. I will cover the exact process in the missile portion of the tutorial. Warheads and nuclear technologies are very straightforward. The left side are the most important and covers the level of nuclear reactors. Higher level reactors produce more facel material or fuel, so they are always worth upgrading. The middle is for nuclear warheads, which get more and more advanced and powerful with each level. The right side covers non-nuclear missiles. Explosive munitions will cause damage to infrastructure and buildings, as well as do org damage to divisions. The EMP is incredibly useful, as it can be used to knock out SAMs, ABMs, and missile silos, effectively neutering the enemy's ability to strike back and stop you from hitting them. Ships, tanks, and planes do not run themselves. With the exception of nuclear-powered ships, all of your vehicles will require fuel in order to operate. I cannot emphasize enough the need to maintain a lot of fuel production. You will always need more than you expect. This will of course depend on your size and what operations you have active. If you are a medium or major power and have armored divisions on the move, aircraft up on missions, and a fleet on convoy rating, you will be using a lot of fuel. Fuel is gotten through either having it in your own territory and keeping a trade law that does not have you export everything, importing the fuel directly, producing it in nuclear reactors, or building biofuel refineries. I would recommend training your entire fleet, air force, and army at once in order to get a rough idea of how much you will need in a war, and build your economy up in order to reflect this. Logistics decides wars. Factions primarily give economic bonuses and hindrances but there are a few that give notable bonuses. In order to change a faction, you must not be a superpower, but if it is affordable, you can change a faction by simply clicking on it. Maritime Industry gives a bonus to dockyard construction speed and output, as well as maximum range. Military Industrial Complexes grant production bonuses and military factory build speed. The military gives a number of combat bonuses, including Moral and Ord. If you want to become a truly capable military powerhouse, consider getting one or more of these factions into your government. It is also worth mentioning certain factions allow you to construct certain types of buildings with foreign investment. Having the military industrial complex lets you build military factories, and maritime industries lets you build dockyards. If you want to be able to build these with your investment capital, you must have the associated faction. Air in this mod appears complex, but once you look deeply into the stats of the different types of planes, it becomes clear that you don't need a bit of everything unless you want it. If you are a warmonger, it is best to produce two types of planes for maximum efficiency and effectiveness. Plus, air support is the foundation of your military power. By keeping up with its research and producing a steady amount of them, you'll be giving your armed forces a massive advantage. Remember to prioritize attack and engines. One or two on range will help if you plan on invading areas without a lot of air bases. In addition to CAS, it is best to research and produce air superiority fighters. These are the best for taking down and winning air engagements with enemy aircraft, and for giving you the air superiority needed to make good use of close air support. If you have a smaller military industrial complex, and are playing a medium or smaller nation, it is much better to produce multi-role fighters, as they are able to do close air support and air superiority missions. They are worse at both, but they are much cheaper to produce than both types of aircraft, and will save you a lot of production costs. Generally speaking for air, you want to have a numerical advantage in places you are pushing and defending. If you have green air, you should be in very good shape. Naval mechanics will be more thoroughly explained in a separate video that will follow. But broadly speaking, it is important to note that heavy attack has been removed, as has torpedo attack, and a new damage type called anti-ship guided missiles has replaced them both. Unlike vanilla, it is more effective for killing screen lines and doing damage than light attack and should be prioritized on your ships. Carriers are also much more lethal than vanilla and are worth building if you can afford it. The 1.7 update will make large fleet sizes effectively damaging for every ship you have, more than the enemy fleet you engage with, giving you a massive positioning penalty if you do so. 
This means a much larger fleet can be defeated by a smaller one due to its size and logistical issues that come with such a massive fleet size. Missiles and nuclear mechanics are one and the same, so we will cover them together. Generally speaking, it is important to know that the AI is not coded to launch at you. It will not do so. Missiles are able to do a lot in Millennium Dawn, whether it be launching a cluster munition to kill an enemy line's organization, an EMP to knock out the enemy's network, or a nuclear missile in their capital to win the war. The menu for missiles and nuclear warheads may be intimidating, but we'll cover it bit by bit. The Missile Production tab is where you are able to produce missiles, satellites, and everything else you might need. In order to produce your desired missile, find what you want, in this case we're going to make ICBMs, select the type you want to make, choose the amount you wish to produce, and assign the amount of civilian factories you plan on using, and then hit start. Assigning more civilian factories simply means that you'll make them quicker, but these factories will not be doing anything else while you do so. At this point, we have covered the ability to create the missile. Once you have made a few of them, you will need to get them set up with launch. The missile mechanics allow you to prepare trajectories before you are in a war or ready to fire. In this screen, you will see both the fire and alert buttons. Making a missile order with fire will result in immediate use when you are able to at the start of every week. The alert option will allow you to set them up in the event of getting hit first. The nuclear doctrine section we will cover shortly but it is important to understand some nations do not have a first strike policy, meaning you can only fire after getting fired upon. Those nations are able to use the alert option to prepare launches against possible enemies. That being said, let's set up a fire order. Start by setting the fire type of order. Choose the missile type. Choose the warhead. Under the salvo, you will pick how many you want to fire every week. We will choose one than this side of the duration. If you want a single strike, hit one. Otherwise, you can choose a higher number allowing you to fire more salvos every week until the amount is reached. For example, let's say we want to fire on Brussels over a period of time. Choose one salvo and click 10 for the duration. That means for the next 10 weeks, Brussels will have one missile fired at it. Do note that not every missile will strike. If the defending nation has proper defense systems in place, they will shoot some down. At this point, you will need to choose a fire location. This can be done anywhere you have built missile silos. Click the button here and then choose the target location. Once the launch starting point and destination are locked in, you can click the fire button, which will make the order active. It is important to note the strike order active the first day of the week, so if you don't immediately see the missile fire, wait until the start of the next week. This is how you fire a missile. After you do it a few times, it will just be a second thought for you. The threat of nuclear annihilation, or the capacity of missiles to make tactical strikes on key locations, has resulted in nations building systems to be able to counteract this threat. Millennium Dawn provides a missile defense system, which when used correctly can stop many missile attacks from enemy nations. If you look at the missile screen, it may seem intimidating, but it's easily manageable. In order to set up your defense system, simply click on the type of missile you want to use, then click Auto Deploy. The game will automatically attempt to stop incoming missile attacks, assuming you have missiles for use. In order to be able to stop an attack, you must have a defense system within range of the location being launched from or targeted. There are multiple opportunities to intercept an enemy missile, and the quality of the intercepting missiles will dictate the efficiency. In addition, having an advanced fleet air defense system gives an AA bonus to ships, which is absolutely massive, making them much harder to damage with naval bombers. The research for these can of course be found in the Air and Missile Defense tech screen. This research screen lets you get nuclear research, primarily better reactors for material production and more potent warheads. The three important researches needed before anything else are these three. Once they are completed, further research and nuclear programs are opened up. Nuclear reactors allow you to produce nuclear material, which is used to produce warheads or to create energy, aka fuel. Since actual energy is not a mechanic in the game, it will turn itself into fuel directly. This is not oil, so it won't be exportable, but will allow you to fuel your fleets and army. You can do so by choosing the Low Enriched Uranium, or LEU. This is only efficient from fuel production. It will make your material production slow, so use HEU for warhead production. Then click the plus button to add sieves to produce it, and choose what percent you want to go to material versus fuel, as you can do both at once. 
When this is done, you will be able to produce fuel, which you can easily see right next to this box. Similar to how we previously made fuel, the production of nuclear material requires both at least one active reactor and the technology for warheads. If both of these are done, then you can start by selecting High Enriched Uranium, or HEU. After which you add the sieves, choose the percent for material versus fuel, and then watch as you slowly get what you need. By choosing the warhead, you will see the amount of material needed for each. Once you have enough in stockpile right above, you will be able to start producing warheads. William Dawn allows one to choose the manner in which nuclear weapons and power are utilized. Some nations outlaw it entirely, while others allow for its use even with first strike. The nuclear status of a country dictates whether they can make nuclear material or fuel, and whether or not it can be used to actually make warheads. Nuclear doctrine dictates how nukes can be used. For example, some doctrines don't allow first strikes, or have preconditions or limits for their use. Read over each one to understand them better. Lastly, look at the top of this menu to see the nuclear deterrence number. This number is an amalgamation of the doctrine, status, and warhead count, and reactor count. For each 100 points of the score, you get a bonus 1% to political power gain. In Millennium Dawn, you will be unable to core annex territories. Only through puppeting and annexation will you be able to get core territories. This is important to keep in mind if you plan to do a lot of expansion and want to get full power over your new territories. This is locked behind the Together to Victory DLC, so keep that in mind if you do not have it. In Millennium Dawn, all equipment and deploy divisions have a cost to maintain. You can see this in the economic menu by hovering over the defensive costs. This is made much more expensive by having a higher GDP per capita, higher quality officer trading, and conscription loss. If you are playing a small or a medium country, or just generally fighting a lot of wars, you may find that you are in need of more manpower. I will quickly overview the main areas you can get more of it. Military spending is a huge decider in military manpower, as it dictates how much of your available pool you actually get to use. If you need more manpower and have spare money in your budget, simply raise this. Conscription laws will also give more recruitable will help you be able to enjoy the mod and focus on playing rather than learning it. If you wish to follow the mod's development, you can do so in the description link to the Millennium Dawn Discord. If you want to play in multiplayer games of Millennium Dawn, you can do so in my Discord, which is also linked there. And also, if you want to see live gameplay, I stream on Twitch, so feel to check that out, and remember to like and subscribe if you enjoy. I'll see you in the next video.